Well, uh, welcome everyone to RAM Symposium. This hour we feature a dive into effort on sponsored projects. Uh, I'm Ben Egolf. I'll be your moderator for this session. Please note that today's presentation is being recorded. This presentation will last about uh, 60 minutes. All participants are currently muted. During interactive portions, though, we invite you to unmute and use your video as you feel comfortable. If you have questions or comments, please use the chat feature or raise your hand and we'll be monitoring that chat box throughout the presentation. Um, closed captioning available under the Teams option menu, and we'll be dropping the survey link uh, for you to complete at the end of today's presentation in the chat. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters today, Shannon Irie and Lauren Lucio. Hello. Hi. I'm Shannon. <laughs> I'm Lauren. <laughs> um, and thank you guys for joining us today for um, our dive into effort. Right. Um, sometimes a, an interesting topic here at CSU, but um, we're going to go through some um, things. And so hopefully we'll make this a little bit less um, of a mystery. How about that? Um, so effort and effort reporting, you know, what are they? Um, we're going to go through some definitions first, and then we're going to go and talk about a little bit about what needs to be done at pre-award and then um, what we do in post-award for the reporting. So, so effort. What is effort? Got a definition up there. It's pretty boring, right? Um, effort is just the portion of time spent on a given professional activity and expressed as a percentage of the total professional activity for which an individual is employed by CSU. Ooh, that's a mouthful. What does it mean exactly? Well, you know, effort is, um, effort is the sum total of all the activities that someone does here at CSU. Um, we can only provide a reasonable estimate of effort if it is divided amongst different projects or different parts of people's um, jobs. Uh, people don't go around with a chip in their brain um, that tells us exactly what they're doing at any given time, so we can only do a reasonable estimate. Um, but we have to have some suitable means of verification. So we'll talk about that a little bit more about what um, that is and who is doing that. Effort has to equal 100% here at CSU. So um, even if someone has a reduced appointment, let's say they're on a 75% um, appointment, um, for our effort reporting, we have to report 100% of that 75%. So you might have a big pie, you might have a little pie, but it's a full pie, um, regardless of um, what we have to, and that we have to certify on all of that. Um, also, effort's not based on a standard 40 hour work week. Um, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of um, people that I have supported in the past. My researchers don't work from eight to five necessarily. A lot of times they're um, emailing people at midnight or um, from across the, from um, Europe in the middle of the night and doing things at a, at a conference at really odd hours. So um, a work week isn't considered 40 hours. It's considered any time you are doing your job. Um, Effort uh, consists of all the activities within that individual's um, appointment. So all the activities, some of it could be research, some of it could be administrative, some of it could be teaching, um, but 100% of your effort is all of those activities. They're all in that same pie. We don't have individual pies for the different things that we do. Um, effort does not um, include outside activities. So at CSU, and this isn't true everywhere, but we do allow um, for some external consulting, um, things of that nature that don't have to do with CSU, your job responsibilities at CSU. Yes. Sorry, I'm very, very brand new faculty, so sorry if this is a silly question, yeah. but I have a nine month appointment. So mm -hmm. does the other three months, where does that fit in to? 100%. Yeah. So if you okay. have funding for those three months, it's all considered part of your whole effort. OK, um, it's and we'll get into this as well. It's just how your institutional based salary is figured okay. um, is the only difference on that. But if you work those other months, it's part of your pie. OK. Great, uh, and great um, question, by the way. Um, I would love to play this video, but it's telling me that I cannot share my sound. 
Um, there is a video from Encura, and it's called the Three Mantras of Effort. There is going to be a um, a link to this video. I suggest everyone watch it um, on the resources that I'll give you with the slides. Um, but because I'm having some techie issues here, um, I don't think that this is going to play. I can try it. All right. Should I try it? <laughs> try it. I'm going to stop it for just a second. Those in the um, virtual world, can you hear this at all? Yes, yeah, Shannon, I'm not getting any sound on my side. Okay, then I'm going to nix it. We're not going to sit and watch something that you guys can't hear. Um, again, um, because I have the owl, um, it's not playing with uh, me being able to share my sound. Um, but I'm just going to go through kind of the highlights of what this video is. And we already talked about some of these um, and her three mantras. They're pretty funny. 100% is 100%. That's the first mantra. So <laughs> we have to um, be certifying and we have to be looking at effort as 100% of what you're doing. Again, that reduced appointment, it doesn't matter. It's 100% of what your job is here at CSU. Uh, number two, there are no nights or weekends when we look at effort. So let's say your PI comes to you and says, well, I'm going to write that proposal on nights and weekends, so I don't have to account for that. That's not part of what I'm doing. No, anytime you're doing your job for CSU or doing something for CSU, um, you don't have nights or weekends. So anytime you are doing your job as part of the activity and part of your appointment, um, that is part of your um, 100%. And then uh, the other one thing is that all activities much, must show up. So within that pie, we don't have little pies, like I said. You don't have a little slice over here that's different just because it's not research or it's not teaching or it's not um, uh, advising your students or something of that nature. All of them have to show up in there. And if you add something to what you're supposed to be doing, you have to carve another little niche into that pie. So um, those are the three mantras of effort reporting is that Everything that you do that's within your appointment, that's within um, that you're doing for CSU, we have to certify that time, which kind of then drives everything else that we're going to talk about. Go for it. There we go. Okay. So then effort reporting. So what is effort reporting? So the um, uniform guidance, which is our main federal sponsor uh, uh, requirements um, and the, it stands for the OMB uniform administrative requirements cost principles audit requirements for federal awards or uniform guidance or some people like to um, shorten it to UG. <laughs> when it first came out we all um, laughed about the fact that UG is exactly what it is but um, it regulates effort reporting and tells us that we have to do effort reporting and um, that we have to report on a regular basis on what people are doing and um, certifying for these for the for the expenses that we're putting on federal projects. We have to certify that it's accurate, that it accurately reflects the work that they're doing on those projects and that we have a suitable means of verification um, on that. Um, uniform guidance doesn't tell us how we have to do that. It just says that we have to. So it's not prescriptive. Um, it doesn't tell us what system we have to use. Um, here at CSU, we use a system that's called ESERT. Um, it doesn't tell us how often we have to do this. Um, it doesn't tell us we have the option. We can do things quarterly. We could do it monthly. We could do it annually. We could do it semi-annually. Here at CSU, we have chosen to do quarterly reporting. And then it also doesn't tell us who has to do the certification, who has the suitable means of verification. Um, there are some institutions that actually have the individuals, like every individual certifies their own time. Um, so let's say you have a research scientist or um, a grad student, then they have to go into a system and they have to say, oh yeah, this is what I'm working on. So um, 
Does anyone in here remember how we used to certify prior? And I'm not going to talk to you because you're brand new. <laughs> brand new faculty won't know this. Does anyone remember how we used to certify here at CSU prior to ESERT coming on? Paper. Yeah. Paper. Then we signed paper. Yeah, who signed those? <laughs> the faculty or PI? Yeah. Sometimes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was it was willy nilly, right? It, um, and did it, did it happen timely? And do you know what happened to them after the fact? Yeah, so it wasn't the greatest of systems, right? So um, CSU went with this system, um, eCert system, and CSU decided a couple of things about how that system was going to be set up. Um, so the other thing about not only does the um, federal government require us to have the system. CSU also has a couple policies in place for effort. Um, the first is our effort reporting pro um, policy, and then we also have a policy that tells us that we have to have an institutional based salary. And um, both, the, both of these policies are um, about how we report effort. So on the effort reporting policy, um, we've decided and it says that we have to have a person Responsible person with suitable means of verification that the work was performed and salary charges are appropriate. So that's our policy. So who at CSU have we designated to be that responsible person? The FO. Well, the FO has a job, but they're not certifying. They're doing they're doing something else prior to the certification. They do the pre-certification, but who ultimately has responsibility for certifying those salaries? Yeah. The PIs, yeah. So at CSU, we have designated the PI. And so it goes, why? Why is the PI the person? So on this um, slide, um, we've decided that um, the PI is going to be the person um, to be held accountable for the for the certification because they have the day-to-day -day management of the project. They know who should be on their project. They are the person that um, should know whether or not somebody is working on their project and how much that person is working on the project um, because they have the responsibility responsibility for the day-to-day -day management of project finances. Um, you know, they need to know what's going on. So. While the university is legally legally responsible to the sponsor, the PI is held accountable, and they're considered, you know, the steward of the the, the project. So they need to have that skin skin in the game. So and again, prior to this, when we had these paper forms, it wasn't always the PI who was signing off on those um, forms. You know, um, sometimes it was the the business officer in the department who was signing off on it. They had no idea. So. Um, that's why the principal investigator has been designated here at CSU. There you go. Okay. So institutional based salary. So um, per uniform guidance, we also have to have um, an institutional based salary. That institutional based salary has to be used for every activity that someone does. The, the reason why the, the federal government wants us to have an institutional based salary is because they're very concerned about fairness. They want to make sure that they are being charged the exact same thing that we charge for every other activity. Um, they don't want to be upcharged. They don't um, and they want to make sure that they're getting the best deal. So whether that's um, in salaries and for this institutional based salary, or that's why we have procurement rules as well. That's why we have contracts and procurement is because um, the federal government and our other sponsors, it's not always just federal government, I just keep throwing that out there, but they all want to make sure that they're not getting charged more than the next guy, that they're getting the best deal that we have. So an institutional based salary um, is established um, through their appointment and that institutional based salary is then charged to every activity that they do. And that also um, means that someone who's on a nine month appointment, if they then have work that they can do in the summer, they will, that institutional based salary will be used also for those additional three months. Um, we can't charge more 
um, than what is already established. But there are some things that aren't included in institutional based salary here at CSU and that those are the bonuses honoraria and honoraria generally comes from a different institution, not necessarily from us. Supplemental pay. So CSU does allow for work above and beyond what your appointment is. They do allow for supplemental supplemental pay, um, but also external consulting. So if you do something that's completely out, maybe it's still within your expertise, but it's not for CSU and someone pays you, CSU does allow for external consulting. And by the way, not all institutions allow for that, but CSU does. Um, and then volunteer work. So, um, but again, we have to also remember there are some of our sponsors that have salary caps, um, in particular NIH. So we can't charge always our institutional base salary. Sometimes we have to charge a lower amount um, if they have a salary cap. And we have to honor that. We can't go back to them and say, well, this is our, this is our rate. Okay, so the next one is I'm going to talk about a little bit of the life cycle of effort reporting. So the, the first two, and I, I like these were my moons. This was my um, nod to a moon, a moon of some sort. Um, but the first two can kind of be swapped a little bit. Um, obviously, the faculty is going to be here and then the proposal is going to go in. But sometimes the staffing happens after we find out that we're going to be funded. So we appoint faculty and possibly staff. Um, we prepare the budget um, and we propose effort in that budget. Um, we make a commitment of what those people are going to do in that proposal uh, and in that budget. Then we have this um, line in there and I didn't put it in there, but in between preparing um, proposal and then charging salary, then we get awarded. That's great. The award comes in and that award comes in saying, OK, this is what you said you're going to do. This is how you said you're going to do it. Um, and a lot of that is with the charging of salaries. And then we charge our salaries. Um, needs to be consistent with the activities that we have going on. Um, adjustments can be made. Timely after the fact, and we have a lot of rules about how we can um, make changes to salaries. That's not what we're going to talk about here today. We're just talking about that effort reporting our effort in general. And then after the fact, we certify those salaries. So we look at them after the fact and say, yes, this was accurate and this was current. I've added a last little bullet point on here because effort reporting also goes beyond this because it goes on to our um, project reporting. So the icing on the cake is then not only did you say that this is what you're going to do in the budget and in your proposal, this is what you charged. This is what you certified was correct. But then in these reports, you're also telling us the same story. You have the same people in those project reports that you have certified their salaries for. So effort reporting is also in that project reporting piece. That's in the annual reports and it's in the final reports. Um, I will tell you if you just went to the audit um, session, one of the things that they do look at is they will pull project reports and they'll start looking at expenses and say, OK, well, you paid for this GRA to go to a conference. Yet you have no salary on there for them, <laughs> and there's not necessarily anything in your project report. That says that this GRA did anything. Why did you pay for that GRA to go to a conference if you didn't do these other things? And then we'll have a finding. And it's a problem, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's not just salaries that our project reporting should be uh, looking back at. Our project reporting should be um, accurately reflecting the expenses that we have put onto the projects. And I know that a lot of the res us research administrators, we don't have any um, say so in those project reports. We don't necessarily see them because a lot of times they're um, put in there. But you know, a lot of us have new faculty that come into us. We can give them this guidance. Hey, they come to us and say, hey, I've got a publication and I'd really like to put it on this project. Well, have you acknowledged that publication? And if you've acknowledged that publication, have you then also put it in your um, your annual or your final report as a deliverable? 
then you know what? Yeah, we can charge that publication to the project. So I'm putting this out there as kind of a whole thing, but just keep in mind that that project reporting does need to also accurately reflect our certifications. Ooh, I had I didn't realize I had. <laughs> you, you guys, I we were going to hold RAM Symposium last spring. And by the way, I put these slides together then. So. But look at me how fancy I am. <laughs> okay. So in a nutshell, again, we um, propose effort. We make a commitment by staffing the project. We charge salaries and then we um, also show that commitment to the sponsor that we are staffing. Um, and if we don't, if we do not charge salary, we must show effort in another way to re represent that commitment. This is kind of a segue into something else we're going to talk about. But again, if you don't have effort on a project, how do they know we're working on it? Um, sometimes, um, you know, sponsors will periodically come back to us and ask us, so there's, you know, did you have any effort on this? Where's your effort? So. Are there any questions so far about what we've talked about? Ben, anything in the in the chat? Nothing in the chat so far. Have I said anything wrong? <laughs> no, great info. Ben's our expert. <laughs> so that's why Ben is here. OK, so okay, turning well. it over to Ms. Lenore. As mentioned, the best way for us to represent <clears throat> committed effort is to um, charge salary to the project, but we do have some instances where that might not be possible. For instance, um, we might have a limited budget ceiling, so there's not room for personnel effort, um, or the sponsor might not reimburse faculty salary. So this is when um, CSU's 1% minimum effort cost share comes into play. You tell me when to record. Go ahead. Um, so our effort reporting policy requires all key, key personnel on a sponsored project to devote at a minimum 1% effort to that project. And if a portion of effort isn't included in the budget for that salary, then we request if we're not requesting that salary in the budget from the sponsor, then we need to show that we are tracking it through a related cost share account. And this cost share account is not reported to the sponsor. Next slide. Um, the minimum effort requirement applies to all key personnel, so the principal investigator, um, co-investigators, and anybody who has a responsibility in the scientific development and execution of the project. So anybody who's considered a key player in the project and is a, a, an employee here at CSU has to follow this um, minimum effort requirement. So before we go on, Another thing to keep in mind, especially at the proposal stage, because we have this 1% requirement, a lot of times, and, and I'm really not trying to, to focus on faculty, I'm not, but faculty want to include everybody as, as senior personnel, right? But this is a big commitment and one that we have to follow because it's a policy. So we need to also be guiding them about, let's really talk about who are key personnel, who really is this person who meets this definition and I realize that you really want to give this opportunity to somebody but let's talk about this because it can become a big administrative burden. Um, failure to document the effort for key personnel can suggest to sponsors and auditors that the individual didn't provide the expertise that we proposed that they would or even that they didn't work on the project. Um, so. We have to show somehow if they're not taking salary from the sponsored budget that they're putting effort toward the project. Um, there are some instances that might not require committed effort, though. So if we're doing if we're applying for an equipment acquisition grant, simply just acquiring equipment that might not require effort from the principal investigator. 
or um, say an individual fellowship award. Um, Let me go forward. Sorry. Yeah, you're good, right? Yeah, right there. So, okay. <clears throat> So these are some of the other exceptions that deviate from the 1% minimum effort requirement. In some of these cases, like the participant support program income and REU supplements, there should already be a, some form of committed effort on the parent project, uh, whether we're taking that from the sponsored budget or tracking it through a non-reportable cost share account. But what about no cost extensions? That can depend. So that's our it depends line. Um, if the no cost extension is for the basic purpose of closing out the award, then we might not need 1% effort from the key personnel on the project. But if substantive work still must be completed, then we either need to be charging salary to the project or tracking it through a non-reportable cost share account. Um, so when you're dealing with a no cost extension, just be sure to talk to your OSP team. Yeah, and the no cost extension forms can be found on the OSP website, and it does have a checkbox for no cost extension. And I know a lot of people at first were like, why is that? I don't, I don't need to have but if you have a lot of work, you still have to have effort. Again, work and effort go hand in hand. So if things are happening on that award, someone's doing it. So, and we have to be able to um, show what that is. Okay, so when would we request the 1% minimum effort cost share account? Anyone? 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 When do we ask for this one percent non-reportable cost share account? We're not taking salary, right? When we're not requesting salary in the budget, and this is for the key personnel and the FBI co-investigators and anyone else who is considered key to the project. Okay, best practices for requesting the 1% non-reportable cost share at the proposal stage. Um, it's best to include a separate budget in the KRPD that accounts for the 1% effort. Um, in our college, College of Natural Sciences, we don't apply indirect costs to this budget and we zero out the fringe because really all we're tracking is the 1% the salary. Um, and then it's also best practice to complete the 1% minimum effort non-reportable cost share account form as best as you can. So you want to complete it to, to the, like, to the fullest. Um, it doesn't need to be signed at proposal stage, but if you have signatures in place, then account creation will be expedited on the post award site. And those forms are really easy to easier to fill out if you've done that separate little budget for it, because then you have all your numbers for it. Um, and then again at award stage, because um, when we get to that award stage, it's a full stop. Go to that. Right. <laughs> um, one more point. Just okay. that's okay because it's non-reportable. We don't want to make any mention of this in the application to the sponsor. So it's just to be tracked internally. So just on a side note, because I just did the NSF talk um, and I have a couple of them here. So when we do that, we have, um, we would make sure that if we're not charging salary, it doesn't show up on the budget, it doesn't show up on the justification, but in particular for NSF, um, we would then put that effort in the facilities, equipment, and other resources because it is a resource to the to the proposal that we're putting in and we want people to know about it and those people might also be talked about in the project narrative so you don't want to add them to your justification um, because then that's voluntary cost share um, so you would add them to those other areas so you're saying mm -hmm. Can you just reiterate that? So yep. you're saying you mentioned the key personnel that are not taking salary in the facilities? Because they're not going to show up in your justification. Oh, okay. Now I got it. Yeah. So you, when we put it in the justification, we're basically telling NSF, oh, we're, we're committing voluntary cost share. 
Okay. <laughs> um, which NSF doesn't want to hear. So if you have people who are going to be working on the project that aren't going to be receiving salary, we put them in the facilities, um, equipment, and other resources section because that's another place where we can talk about what they're doing without voluntarily committing to that cost share, even though we, that's exactly what we're doing. So, so we're, no, we're not reporting it back to them. Yeah, just considering it a resource to the project. Yeah. Um, and then at, at the award so, stage, you just want to make yeah. sure that you do have that um, form filled out and signed because that will hold up the uh, creation of your 53 account. Any questions on that? I know that this has been, and I know that every department has kind of their own practices. Sometimes they don't fill out these forms at the proposal stage. I'm just suggesting, and we're suggesting as a best, best practice, and for yourself, that if you have them partially filled out, then you're that farther along. Not only that, but there's not really anything in the KRPD document that tells people down the line, like the department head or anywhere else that, you know, there's going to be some forms coming along and that um, these people don't have effort on this project. Um, then talking about the 1% one min, one minimum cost share, it's important to keep in mind that even though we are not reporting it to the sponsor, it's still cost share and um, CSU is still reporting on it financially and it still um, negatively impacts our indirect cost rate when we go back to renegotiate with the federal government. So we always want to charge the salary to the sponsor budget when possible, always do. And then also the other consideration with the 1% minimum effort is just the added administrative burden on the post award side. Anybody want to agree to that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a cost share account. We have to track it. We have to, you know, they're reporting on it. I mean, it's an extra account for everybody, including, you know, centrally, you know, when we're having to do the certification. So um, I'm hearing also that on the post award and these, um, 1% minimum effort cost share accounts are not closing at the same time that a project ends and that kind of creates more confusion as time goes on. Um, we have what is like one example is that we have a faculty member in biology who has a dual appointment with the um, grad school and she is submitting proposals left and right and not requesting salary for herself and we're getting to a point where her pie or research is very small and we can't support one percent effort anymore and so these are just things to consider when when um when we're thinking about doing the one percent minimum effort so on the opposite spectrum we're going to talk about 100% effort on sponsored projects. And what are the implications about um, putting 100% of somebody on a sponsored project? So again, let's think about our pie. We say that someone's 100% working on a project. That's all they can do. They have no other. They have no other slices of anything that they're doing. That they are literally living, breathing dying for this project. That's it. So my, my challenge to all of you is to think about who actually is doing that. And um, let's start talking about when it's appropriate. So again, we have our policy. It's the same policy that we keep coming back to. And per our effort reporting policy, generally faculty cannot commit 100% of their effort on sponsored projects. So, you know, why? Why can't faculty spend 100% on their projects? Because we have to teach and do service and <laughs> other commitments. Right? Yeah, faculty have a lot of other commitments, right? Um, and I'm not sure, I, I, and it differs by um, department and by whatever, but the appointment letters, I think, usually have a percentage. Do they? Did yours have a percentage of what was expected of you? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think sometimes it's like 60% teaching and then 40% or not 40, 30% um, possibly research and then other administrative tasks or something of that nature. But um, 
So even by their appointment letters, <laughs> it says that they are not doing 100% research. So um, per our effort reporting policy, we have to put systems in place in order to make sure that our faculty are not paid 100% on. Um, and that's usually fairly a little bit easier for faculty because faculty have um, you know resident uh, um, instruction. They've got startup packages. Sometimes people have gift funds. I mean, there's other sources and place, uh, places that we can put faculty time on um, to reflect those other duties. Um, but what about research staff? These guys are generally 100% soft funded. But then there's postdocs and proposals sometimes yeah. as investigators. And so that's where it becomes sticky. It does become sticky. And um, then we have students. Students are sometimes a little bit easier. Um, so I'm going to go back on something that I said that 100% is 100%. Of course we are, because it depends, right? <laughs> We're in research administration. But um, students are generally, especially G, um, GRAs, they're set up as only a 50% FTE because it is expected that that other 50% of their time is devoted to classes and to coursework. So when we're talking about the FT, we're doing away with their academic. We're just pretending that it doesn't exist, basically. So we do have a lot of GRAs that are 100% on research projects for that research piece. And that's that can be okay. Yeah. Does that mean that we would be able to, like if they're working for us as a research assistant in the summer, be able to pay them more? Because presumably whatever they're making as a TA or GRA during the school year is only 50% of their salary. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, every department has their own rules about how or what you can do. Okay. Um, I was in the Department of Atmospheric Science and our students, our GRAs were paid 50% during the academic and then we bumped them up to 75% during the summer because it was expected that they would be doing a lot more research during the summer okay. and be, um, be doing that. But research staff, I'm going to go back to the research staff because they're always the sticky ones, right? Um, there are some research staff that truly all they are doing is that one project that they were hired to do. But we have other research staff, especially senior research staff. They're 100% soft funded. And sometimes there's a lot of an expectation that they're going to be writing proposals or helping out with proposals and being those co eyes or even PIs of their own right on these proposals and bringing in some of their own funds. So we have to come up with solutions for those research staff. Um, and I would just suggest that they need to be looked at on a case by case basis. Um, according to what they're doing. So any questions about that? Because I know that that's it's a hard one. We don't always have additional funds in the department to pay for this piece of pie that we're slicing out, right? So. Okay. Well, we went through that really quickly. I thought that you guys would have lots more to talk about and discuss with us. Any questions that anyone has about? Yes. So recently we in chemistry had um, an NSF proposal and one of the key personnel did not want to charge his salary because he was he wasn't leading it. He was a co-PI and he wanted to leave more funds for other things. And we were told that, that we were not allowed to do the 1% non-reportable. I think that was a misunderstanding. And um We've actually had a conversation and worked that out. And the one percent, because it's non-reportable, it is allowable. Okay. Yeah, because that got really confusing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, and keep in mind that um, at proposal stage, um, especially for co for key personnel, we propose a certain amount of effort, and we're not allowed to reduce that effort by a certain percentage. And it's generally twenty five more than twenty five percent without asking for permission from the sponsors. So let's say you had a co, a co PI or someone who's like, I am not doing as much as I was going to, this graduate student's coming in to do this and I want to reduce my effort and give it to them. You can go back to the sponsor and ask for that, but they have to then agree. That's one of the prior approvals yeah. that we need to. Anytime a PI, um, a co PI or a key personnel disengage 
from a work, we have to ask for permissions. So, because they, you got the award based upon this commitment that we made in the proposal that these are the people that are going to be working on this. You know, we, we were awarded these funds because generally, you know, they like what this PI or this co PI or this key personnel are going to be doing. So it's usually not awarded because of the GRA. It's going to be based on, you know, the, you know, these other people that are doing this work. Having a GRA is obviously a bonus, but that's, yeah. Any other questions about effort? I feel like we went. Ben, is there anything else that you would yeah. want us to cover about effort? Uh, that was fantastic. We did have one question in the chat. Uh, if we want a refresher on the 1% minimum cost share issue, specifically the order of operations and forms, who should we re reach out to? And Jenny pointed out uh, your OSP uh, team assigned to your college or unit. Yeah, always if you have questions, reach out to your um, team. Um, they have, they'll help you and guide you. There are forms on OSP's website as well for all these for all of these, but I do know that sometimes they're um, first time I opened up one, I was like, I do not know what I have to fill, which parts of these we have to fill out. So reach out to the team and they will be your best guide for that. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a participant support question. Yeah. I don't know if that's, I mean, it's somewhat related, but participant support for employees of CSU. Generally, how do we do it? <laughs> so participant support is generally for trainees um, and people who are coming in for training and for other and from outside entities. Every once in a while, we can add like a GRA student into that participant support. It's generally not one we want to go to. We have to ask permissions um, in order to add an employee as a participant. And usually it's not going to be able to be a research staff or a faculty or someone like that. Um, but a, a student kind of straddles that training um, definition that they have. Um, I have had it allowed on one workshop that we had. We did a workshop conference and we had X amount of people. Uh, and we said that we were going to find, let's say 15, we only had 12 people that we identified for that workshop that we were bringing in. So we had some additional participant support. And so we went back to the sponsor and said, hey, we've got these two students that are here. Um, is it okay if we bring them in for that workshop? Uh, there's, there's some real rules about what you can then reimburse for those people. And off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly what that was, but I think we were able to pay for the registrations. You have to be able to make a clear distinction too between the the person's employment and their participation in yeah. that whatever they're participating in. There has to be a clear delineage between the two. Yeah, and I don't believe we were able to pay for any per diem or anything of that nature. But um, if I if I remember correctly, I think it was the registration that we were able to identify and then let those um, employees go. So it wasn't all of the categories that we were allowed to. And again, it's something that we definitely went back to the sponsor and asked before doing it. So. Any other questions? Yeah, not necessarily a question because I think I know the answers to it, but more of a, a topic to bring up and maybe discuss. But um, I know in theory for faculty who have a nine month appointment, they are not supposed to save up summer salary and just put their summer salary onto sponsored projects. But in reality, that happens frequently. So I'm just wondering how you can navigate it from all the different levels of either that is okay or that is not okay. Like obviously that's a huge gray area, but I'm just wondering on the, the departmental side of the people actually having to deal with the PIs and the faculty, saying, well, we're going to do it that way because we've always done it that way, blah, blah, blah. Um, how to kind of navigate all of that. Yeah, you know, there's a couple things here to unpack. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, sometimes they are 100% working on research in the summer, mm -hmm. right? Um, sometimes you have a big field campaign or you have something that's going on and it's perfectly appropriate that they should be being paid 
on, you know, um, on a research grant during the summer, and that's it. Um, but more often than not, faculty still in that pie doesn't mean that those other duties always go away in the summer. So in our department, what we did is that we took a portion of their um, their instruction. And we allocated a little bit of it to every month in the summer. So that they were never 100% on projects. Um, we did have to get permission at one point in time to be able to do that. So I don't know if that's still a thing um, except several years ago, but that's how we kind of dealt with that is by putting because they were still advising. They were still creating course content. They were still doing other things that were academic. Um, it's, it's also silly to say that the only time that you're doing academic work is in those nine months, mm -hmm. right? It just as silly as it is to say that you have never done it, you can't be 100% on research. Well, it's also silly that, you know, a nine month um, faculty member is not also still working in the summer on doing some of this stuff. So um, I think it, that made perfect sense. So that's kind of what we did. Um, for that, but keep in mind that there are instances. Again, it depends. There are instances when people truly will be working just on research. And the other thing about that is that we do our certifications in three month increments quarterly. And the summer is um, in two quarters. So during that quarterly certification, your faculty is not going to necessarily be 100% on research during that quarterly certification. And again, I'm gonna go back to that. We can only do what we reasonably can figure out and um, institutes of higher education do get a little bit more of a pass, especially for faculty. Um, the sponsors do understand how our faculty is paid <laughs> and they do understand that there are gonna be some institutions that make it extremely difficult for them to be able to not be 100% during certain times. So. Again, we can only do what we can reasonably. Again, it's that chip in the brain, right? Yeah. No one goes around with the chip in the brain telling um, me exactly what they're doing at all times. So I'm not sure if that helped you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Any questions after that little? Did anyone have any better solutions or um, things that they're doing in their own departments or units? That type. Did everyone get cold last night? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to turn my heater on yet. You haven't turned on your heater yet? No, I don't want to. <laughs> okay, am I the only wimp? I haven't even got the fireplace going. <laughs> Mine's more that I had to cover the garden last night. So, okay. I still have stuff in there that I want to. I want to gather. Okay. Well, um, we will send these. Uh, the Handouts, by the way, are already loaded onto the OSP website under our training um, drop down and under RAM Symposium. And all of these links work. Uh, if there's anything else that anyone needs, please feel free to shoot a question to myself or to Lauren or Ben. Um, again, Ben is the expert on this because he runs our eCert system very well. So um, if anyone has any specific questions, just let us know. But we really appreciate you guys all joining us today for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.